Hello, everybody. Welcome to um, the to today's lecture. Uh, my name is Rosa Carrasquillo. I'm the director of Latin American Latino Studies, and we are very happy to be today. Uh, we are closing our lecture series on race and the national imaginaries in the Americas, which was made possible with the support of Latin American and Latino Studies, Africana Studies, the Carlson Chair Asian Studies, and the McFarland Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture. Our conversation about race um, and nations began uh, with a historian, then we continue talking about it with an anthropologist, and now we're ending uh, a conversation and possibly continuing the conversation with a philosopher uh, to ice the cake. I'm very, very honored to introduce today's speakers. And um, I have admired Jorge uh, for a long time, his work. I have used his work in my classes. So I'm just going to highlight just a very few of his accomplishments because there are so many that I will spend more than half an hour reading them all. So just a few. Jorge Gracia holds the Samuel Kappen Chair in the Philosophy and is Sony Distinguished Professor. He was educated in Cuba, the United States, Canada, and Spain. Gracia is the author of 14 books. No wonder he can remember all the titles of his book, right? <laughs> and over 200 articles published in the United States, Europe, Latin America, and China. Gracia has edited more than 24 volumes in subjects such as metaphysics, hermeneutics, medieval and Latin American philosophy, ethics and racial issues, and philosophy of religion. He sits on the boards of more than a dozen philosophy journals and edits an interdisciplinary series on Iberian and Latin American culture and thought. So please join me to welcome Jorge Gracia. It's a delight to be here, and I'm very uh, happy that uh, for the invitation. I've come to uh, Holy Cross, I think this is the third time, the third time. So it has always been a pleasure, and uh, every time I've done something different and uh, so forth, so it, it's been a, a lot of fun. So thank you very much for the invitation uh, to Professor uh, Rosa Carrasquillo. Uh, now, what I want to do today is talk about affirmative action. By the way, the people at the back, can they read over here, or is that too, too, too small? If it's too small, you have to move up here, because uh, we can't just lower it. Huh? You have to have good eyes. If not, you'll hear me, and probably that will be enough. <laughs> Certainly, it will be enough to some. All right, so uh, what I want to talk about is affirmative action for Latinos in particular. But as you know, affirmative action is out of fashion these days. Affirmative action is a topic that uh, generally people don't want to hear about. They don't even want to smell it. They don't want to touch it. They don't want to have anything to do with affirmative action. Affirmative action has become a bad name. There have been cases, uh, legal cases, judicial cases, in which people have argued that, in fact, affirmative action is based on discrimination and therefore has to be eliminated. So basically, affirmative action was a kind of uh, uh, a set of procedures, uh, measures that were uh, devised to eliminate discrimination in one way or another. And now uh, it's accused of being actually a source of discrimination. And you can understand why. Take, for example, the case of college admissions. This is a very hot topic and one that you understand very well because affirmative action has been <clears throat> really zeroing in. The, the critics of affirmative action has ze have zeroed in on the whole idea of uh, college entrance, uh, examin college entrances. And uh, the argument goes something like this. Do you really think just that someone who is entering college or has applied to come to college be denied admission because someone else is being accepted merely on the basis of race or uh, 
ethnicity or any other criterion that is not purely academic. The idea is that Anglo-Saxon students, Anglo-American students are being denied admissions in colleges because some minority students are being accepted and taking their positions. And who are these students? These students would be uh, African Americans, they would be Latinos, <clears throat> and so forth. And the criterion or the criteria for accepting ones and, the, and rejecting the others is simply a matter of race, ethnicity, and so forth, and not academic criteria. That sounds pretty bad, in fact, and if you are a person that has been rejected admission precisely because you are, uh, you have not been rejected because you are Anglo-American, but someone else who is not Anglo-American has been accepted and taken your place because the person is a member of a minority group, you really would feel very sore. So that's the case today. The problem is, is there a place for affirmative action in the U.S. today? For some people, there shouldn't be a place because actually affirmative action, what it does is really do the same thing that it was meant to eliminate. Now, what I want to do is to look at three cases uh, to see, uh, to show, to illustrate why there is still an argument for affirmative action. And probably you have heard these, uh, of these cases before, not of the particular cases, but of similar cases. I became aware of this when one student, a Puerto Rican student, came to my office uh, several years ago. And he came, he was taking a course with me on medieval philosophy, which is nothing, something that uh, only the most uh, uh, strong and uh, um, tough guys and women in the college are willing to do. It's a medieval philosophy. It's a very, very esoteric subject matter. I'm a specialist, a specialist on that, and therefore you can see that I'm very tough. Well, anyway, so the point is that this student, who was Puerto Rican, came to my office, and he wanted to know how was it that I, a Latino, was able to occupy a position in a research university such as the one that, uh, in which I teach, which is the University of Buffalo, and had a chair, an endowed chair in the university, and moreover was a, a named distinguished professor. So here's a Latino who is a rarity in having these positions in a research university, particularly, particularly in fields like philosophy, where language is key to making a good career. And so the, uh, the whole idea for him was, how could I repeat your feet? How could I become another Jorge Gracia? And, and so forth. Or, what's the secret? How did you do it? Well, the fact is that uh, I felt very, uh, you know, satisfied. I felt very honored. I felt very good because here there was a student who wanted to be just like me, who admired me, admired what I had been able to do, and so forth. So it was great. And, of course, I could have answered him with what he wanted to hear. And what he wanted to hear was that anybody can do it if you work hard, and so forth. In other words, the myth of the self-made man. I was a self-made man because I came from Cuba, in 1961, yes, a long time ago, and uh, <clears throat> I was just turning 19 the, the, the uh, date, the day that I entered the U.S. soil, and I had come without my family, with five dollars in my pocket, and in a period of months I entered college, and that was the beginning of a career that has been fairly successful. 
So I could have said, look, you can do it. This is, is doable. I'm this kind of person, and so on and so forth. But the fact is that there was a little something different about it that was playing into my situation that was being ignored. As a philosopher, I like to, que I like to question things. And so I said, well, is this really... I mean, what this student brought to my mind was, is this really the story that merits to be told? And it turns out that, in fact, when you think about what happened to me, you obviously have to accept the fact that it is true that I came with $5 in my pocket, that for the first time in my life, in the four months that I stayed in, my, in Miami, I was hungry many times, that I had to play cards in order to uh, supplement the little money that the U.S. government gave me to uh, buy a hamburger or something like that, and uh, that I had done all kinds of jobs, like for example, I tried to sell ice cream, spent the whole day trying to sell ice cream, and sold one ice cream in the whole day. But the interesting thing was that the ice cream I sold, I sold to myself. So <laughs> I was a complete failure. Okay, salesmanship is not my, my, my kind of thing. But the point is that that story like that, you know, had a great, I mean, if, if I had told him that story, it would have made him feel that I was a superman of some kind, the self-made man. The truth of the matter is that there was a second level of the story. And the second level was that I came to the U.S., and the U.S. at the time, because I was a refugee, gave me immediately a stipend of $75 a month to support myself. Of course, that was not enough to support myself. I had to pay something like $65 to the rooming house where I stayed. But how did I get the rooming house? <coughs> I got the rooming house because the person that was running the refugee center in Miami was a friend of my mother's. And she helped me to find the rooming house. Not only did she do that, she actually wrote to the uh, president of the college where she had graduated from and told him, I have this student here who's a, you know, a good student, a good person, and so on and so forth, and he's... Uh, completely devoid of any help of any kind. We need to help him. He will be great for you, and so on and so forth. The result of that was that the president of the college himself approved my entrance into the college. In addition to that, the U.S. government had actually a program for Cuban refugees, for Cuban refugees that were accepted into college. And the program was that they would lend up to $500 a semester to the students that they would have to repay, of course, after they graduated and so forth, uh, to help them graduate, uh, go to college and graduate from college. So I had actually a number of people or programs that actually helped me. One was the $75 that the government gave me. The other one was the $500 that uh, was used for the college. And the other one was the help of this particular person who had a contact with the president of the college and actually made possible my entering college. So all of a sudden, if you take that into consideration, what do you see? You see that I was not that superman, that I was a self-made man, not quite. I was sort of a constructed man with all kinds of helps from other people. The government had helped. Friends had helped me. So that is, of course, <coughs> that makes the story or my story quite different. Now, if you compare my case with that of w, uh, George W. Bush, the situation is even more different. Because here is Bush, who is the son of a big U.S. clan, lots of money, Lots of money going to, to, to the coffers of the universities to which he applied. Lots of money 
and power and so on and so forth. Very undistinguished grades and so forth. So he couldn't really make it on his own in terms of academic standing. But he had all this background. I mean, look, Yale and so on would be delighted to have people like that because they, you know, need the support of big donors. And besides, who knows, he might be president someday. And lo and behold, he did become president. And then that certainly made his colleges very important. So, as you know, it is standard for colleges and universities to reserve a certain number of entrance places for people who are children of people who had gone to those institutions or that have certain things to contribute to the college, namely what? Money. So you have three situations. That of Jorge Gracia, who at the beginning looked very much like the self-made man, but actually when you looked into it carefully, there was a lot of help that he received. You have the case of George W. Bush, which is the story of someone who didn't even have to bother to worry about getting into college because he had the whole thing uh, handed down to him. And then we have the story of my Puerto Rican student. Now, my Puerto Rican student himself was a result of some affirmative action because without affirmative action, most likely he would not have gotten into college. So he was in part the result of affirmative action. So what do we have here? We have a situation which, unless you have some backing of some sort in society, unless you are favored because of your background, because of your um, family, because, and so on and so forth, you really don't have a chance, or you have a very little chance. Now, what's the object of affirmative action? The object of affirmative action is only to level the playing field, to make up for the deficiencies that some members of this society have, deficiencies that are not the result of their own doing, but deficiencies that are the result of the way the society is structured. And because of that, need some help I had help, the money that the government gave me, and so on. So this, uh, which by the way, I have paid and repaid greatly because I have paid taxes through my ears, and <clears throat> so the little money that the U.S. government gave me, which made possible my going to college and begin my academic career, has actually been a tremendous investment for the U.S. government and for the taxpayers of this country, which is something that is often missed. All right, now, so that's sort of an illustration of affirmative action. Now, let's take a look at the general aims of affirmative action. This I have put down here. First, to ensure a diverse population. So when people try to talk about the aims of affirmative action, you have to be clear because there are different types of aims that one can have. One is an aim of diversity. Okay, I'll talk about that uh, in a minute when we uh, get into uh, the group of Latinos. Uh, the second one is to preserve certain special rights, such as linguistic rights, for certain groups. The idea that certain groups in society should uh, have certain rights for particular reasons. The third, to ensure equal opportunity for those who, because of their gender, racial, or ethnic background in particular, have not had equal access to opportunities open to members of different gender, racial, or ethnic group. The fact is that if you are white for many years, and even today up to a certain extent, you have certain advantages that if you are not. And if you are uh, Latino, you will have certain disadvantages that other people will not have. And if you look in a certain way, you certainly will have certain disadvantages or advantages. There is research that shows, actually, that if you are good-looking, what people generally consider good-looking, your grades are better than those of other people that are not good-looking. 
Because the teachers like you. <laughs> We're human. Okay, so this is a very, so <clears throat> next time you need to go and do facial, <laughs> facial. Uh, <laughs> of course, when you get as old as me, what do you do? I need a new head, a new body, the whole thing. Full, full body transplant, yes. Okay, fourth, to make reparation for past wrongs, which are the result of discrimination against groups on the basis of gender, race, and ethnicity. And the, the most serious case of that is uh, American, uh, American, African Americans, of course, because slavery left an indelible mark on their history. And what about the fifth, to promote the participation of underrepresented gender, race, and ethnic groups in the life of the nation? That is, there is a point at which you want all members of all groups in the nation to participate in its life. And I'm going to say that something more about that in a minute. Okay, these general aims are actually translated into more specific ones. And here I have these uh, five. Removal of structural obstacles in society to the development of the target groups. There are obstacles in, in society that prevent certain people to get through and achieve the aims that they want to achieve. Uh, elimination of prejudices that in certain situations can be unfair, ad, unfair advantage to some. <clears throat> like for example, if you are a Mexican American or a Latino, the general prejudice is that you are lazy. Okay? That you, are, you subscribe to the mañana philosophy. Tomorrow I'll do it. Tomorrow, mañana I will do it. And so forth. Well, you know, you go to a job that needs really to be on time and so forth. You are Mexican-American. You are not. Well, uh, that one. The one that is not Mexican-American. Okay. Uh, special education and training of members of target groups who have been deprived. Remember the fact that blacks were not supposed to learn to read and write. In fact, that was punished very strongly. Okay. So imagine... Who's going to make up for that? The people that actually prevented them from learning to read or write? No, there has to be some other uh, entity, namely the government or something. Adoption of laws and regulations which ensure the equitable distribution, application of the laws and distribution of goods. The laws on the country, of the country have to be applied equally to everyone and not just selectively. And the last one, an appointment, an appointment of members of under the represented gender, led racial and ethnic group to positions of authority in the society so that they can actually be looked upon as authoritative and change the conception that the general society has of the particular group. Now, what are the basis of affirmative action? On what basis do we argue for affirmative action on two bases, justice and utility. One issue is, is it just that someone is treated this way or that way and so on? So if the argument is, on, I mean, one way is to argue in terms of justice. The system has been unjust and therefore it has to be changed so that justice prevails. Now we all want justice, don't we? I mean, don't we, for example, if we have been denied entrance in college for reasons that have nothing to do with academic performance, don't we feel aggrieved? Don't we want justice? We all want justice. But we usually want justice for ourselves and not for others. It's very easy to have justice for oneself and not for others. The point is that if we're going to be just, justice has to be applied to everyone. And then the other one is utility, the use, what we can get out of measures such as those, more or less, uh, those aims that uh, were listed before. <coughs> Why is utility here a factor? Because society wants ultimately to be better, to have a better lot for all its members, okay? And a society in which some peoples are deprived or are not 
participating in the full measure of what others participate in, in the particular society, you have a situation which is unhealthy. One example in economics, everybody talks about, you know, complaints about handing out money to poor people and so forth. And I agree, handing out money to poor people is just a last gap measure. But the aim of every society should be to improve the lot of everyone. As I was saying at the beginning, the fact that I was, tr I came to the U.S. without a penny. I did not invest. Well, I invested the five dollars that I had, okay? But outside of that, I didn't have anything else to invest. What is it that I, and uh, so, so the government gave me a certain help, and that was the government's investment. The government was acting as part of the American people. Uh, that investment paid off. I, as a professor in a university, as a man of a certain, um, with a certain amount of wealth and so forth, am more valuable to the society than someone who doesn't have a penny. So it's a matter of an investment. Now, what about justification for affirmative action for Latinos in particular? Some, of th some things actually work uh, in certain ways for Latinos and not in others. And we have to be actually aware of these things because sometimes some measures that are taken as affirmative action actually are very con counterproductive. Now one thing that affirmative action for Latinos falls into would be ensuring the certain type of diversity in the population. Now diversity means what? Means that you have different people in the nation, okay? So you want a society that is rich on diversity. The question is, why is diversity better? Well, ask a biologist. Why is diversity better? Why is gene a, a varied genetic pool better than one that is not varied? Well, it just works that way, doesn't it? If you have a group of people that inbreed, what do you get? You get lots of diseases, lots of problems. If you, the best example of a, of, of, of a biological inbreeding is dogs. Dogs nowadays live six years. Some dogs, after two years, are having problems with their hips and so forth. I've seen dogs with hip replacements. Why is it that dogs have that particular problem? Because of the inbreeding. The breeds are kept separate. You want purity, and purity results in what? In a low, lower strength in the biological makeup of these animals. And the same thing happens for us. But transfer that to culture. What is it that we do in a society that is multicultural? We learn from people who think differently than we think. And that's the first the essential uh, element in progress and change. Because people who, don't, who are not exposed to the ideas of other people are stuck in their place. Why is it that the U.S. is such a powerhouse of, of uh, development and invention? Precisely because there is this freedom and exchange of ideas. So you go to, uh, to California or whatever, San Francisco, and uh, look at the, and, and go into a place where they have uh, large technology uh, uh, development. Who do you find there? You find Chinese, you find Indians, you find, you find the best of the best there. And what they do is that they learn from each other. If you are in your cubicle in some place, just thinking yourself, what is actually reading a book? If not exposing yourself to what other people have thought, 
What is, in fact, reading a book about a different culture, if not actually becoming exposed to what that other culture had to offer? Why do we read books? Why do we go to school and learn science and so on and so forth? Because we are exposing ourselves to what other people have found out. But if you want to, you can have your whole little group of people at home and never talk to anybody and so forth. Where are you going to go? Not very far. Well, in a culture, it's the same thing. Inbreeding is the death of that culture. The important thing in cultures is precisely to learn from each other. Even if you actually are exposed to a certain culture and reject what that culture proposes, that is an advancement because it will prevent you from making the same mistakes that that culture or those people in that culture made. Okay, uh, let me give you a little anecdote about the, uh, since I have to um, cut this short. So we're going to deal only with diversity. Okay, the nature's effort to ensure diversity. There is this uh, uh, experiment or study that has been going on for quite a while about uh, the role of smell in sexual attraction between males and females. Some of you may have been exposed to that particular study. It's wonderful. <laughs> it's wonderful because, listen to what happened. Uh, females are generally, generally disliked, are repelled by male smell. Maybe you didn't know that. But anyway, they, they really don't like us. I mean, they like us, but they don't like how we smell. Except, except when they are ready to ovulate, when they are ovulating. When they are ovulating, of course, they are ready to be inseminated. So they like the, the male smell. But there is a catch, which is extraordinary. They have measured the type of smells that various males have. And the females go for the ones that are farther genetically from them. In other words, they like the men who are going to enhance <laughs> their, their genetic pool. And this is completely <laughs> unconscious, of course. What's going on here? Nature has actually devised a way for the human race to actually prevent inbreeding. Okay, I think that probably we should leave it there since that's the, uh, the time that we have and then there will be some questions. So, in other words, affirmative action has a place. Now, I didn't uh, get to talk about some of the problems that affirmative action has, but I think that you can figure those out. <laughs> okay, yes, there is an international elite, there is no question. And, well, you have, you have an elite, there are different elites. There is an elite, for example, that has to do with power and money. But there is also an elite that has to do with science and, and so forth. I mean, I, I think that actually we are members of an elite here uh, in the sense that we live in this rarefied atmosphere of intellectual advancement and so forth. Um, now, the question is... Uh, How does this jive with the whole business of affirmative action? Uh, I think that everybody wants to get to those elites in one way or another. I mean, those, those who actually are alerted to those elites. Many people do not even, are not even alerted to them. Now it's more, it's more uh, evident because we have all these means of communication and this global uh, village, as it were. So people know, for example, that there are people who make, you know, who are super rich, they have $5 billion. And there are people who know that have a pretty good life in colleges like this and, you know, uh, universities and so forth. And people then want that. People want that, like my students, my Puerto Rican students. But the point is that in order to get to those places, uh, 
well, there are some that are in those places simply because they inherited money or they were born in the right families. And this is another part of the whole thing that, that you know, people think about needs leveling in some fashion because some of us have had great advantages and others haven't. And so how can you, you don't want to push people who had advantages down. What you want is to be able to give those that did, did, do not have advantages, uh, you want to raise them to a level where they can compete, they can, ha they can have choices. Uh, but many of these people that live at a certain level, they are not even aware of you know, what they could do. They don't know how to organize themselves and so on. If you come from a family where your parents and your grandparents and so forth went to college and university, the expectation is that you will go to college and university and so on. But if you didn't, well, you're already, the die has been cast and it's a miracle that you are, even make it. So this is, this is the role of some affirmative action uh, that I see. No, class is very important, of course. Yeah, class is very important. Yeah, affirmative action has to ex extend beyond. Uh, in many, it, let me put it this way: the the government has uh, programs that are meant to actually help people that are at a lower, from a lower academic and uh, social status, to move up. Okay. Now, today I was talking primarily in the context of Latinos, which is an ethnic group and can be also a racial group in some ways. So that's why I uh, talked about that. But obviously, uh, this is a conversation between liberals and uh, conservatives about the need to have affirmative action, in other words, measures that tries to raise the whole population, regardless of class or uh, status so that they are free to move and, and uh, flourish, as it were, yeah. In other words, affirmative action based on need rather than on the, but then, but then, you see, it's based on need, but then coupled with academic performance, yeah. And th th that, most people think that that is not as controversial. But that, you know, there, there is no, social group that you can identify, that, let's, let's put it this way. Uh, the issue of affirmative action was primarily on the basis of people who because of their race, ethnicity, uh, sexual orientation, that has been expanded to include sexual orientation, uh, gender, and so on, are discriminated against. Women in general do not have a lower status or a lower, uh, let's say, You cannot say that, that you know, uh, there is a parallel between minorities and uh, w there, there are some important differences between women and minorities. Well, race is just one of the things in which, but how can you, but, but the point is, are the, uh, is race, if you, if you try to gather only people who are disadvantage, uh, you will say uh, race f falls into that. But it's not quite right, although in some cases, in certain situations, it might, but not, not necessarily the case. So you cannot substitute, I mean, there are cases of discrimination that do not have to do with a particular Well, does it have to do always with class? This is a discussion that, that Marxists have with uh, others who favored uh, some kind of affirmative action. And that is, the Marxists want to actually reduce all cases to economic cases. I'm not sure that that is, that is possible because a lot of discrimination is because of a certain um, race or ethnicity, uh, and not just because people are poor, because there are lots of white people that are poor. My Puerto Rican student, I, <laughs> he left. <laughs> so actually, I didn't, I didn't, I told him more or less 
what he wanted to hear, but not exalting me and so on. Uh, but I don't, I don't think that he was prepared for what he had to do. He wasn't sure and so on. So he actually, uh, I never heard from him after he finished his course. So I don't know whatever happened to him. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.